Welcome first graders to the Dallas Sign Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center and a special welcome to the students at Thomas L. Marcellus Elementary STEAM Academy. Thank you for registering for this field trip. If you are watching this and you have not registered for today's field trip, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. Uh, we just use that information for attendance purposes. And today's uh, virtual field trip is going to be about heating and cooling. So during this virtual trip, students will observe changes in materials caused by heating and cooling. So we are going to start the day off by exploring evaporative cooling. That should be really cool. Then we are going to uh, look at heating and cooling in the sun versus the shade. Then we're going to heat things up by looking at a solar oven and how to cook using that. And we'll finish things up using a bouncy ball investigation. And if you're wondering what a bouncy ball has to do with heating and cooling, uh, just watch and you will find out. While we're doing all of those activities, uh, you can ask us questions. Uh, but since this is a virtual field trip, you'll need to use this website to ask any questions. And that is www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And you can ask us as many questions related to heating and cooling as you like. And uh, as many questions as you like, and we'll do our best to answer all of those in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So we're going to get it started off with uh, evaporative cooling with Mr. Monroe. Okay, good afternoon, first graders. My name is Mr. Monroe, and the topic that I'm going to be uh, teaching about to th this afternoon is going to be evaporative cooling. And uh, we're going to learn about how that process works, and then we're going to examine why it's so important, okay? Now, before we get started, I need to uh, make you, uh, well, not make you, but help you to understand that, you know, water can be uh, actually one of three different natural states. In its gas form, it's invisible. In its liquid form, of course, we can see that it's all all around in ponds and lakes and rivers and streams. And when you turn your faucet on, it comes out of the faucet, right? And then it can also be in solid form, like an ice cube. Evaporation is the changing of the liquid form into the gas form. And that is a big part of evaporative cooling, okay? Now, let's say, well, better yet, let me give you this little simple experiment that you can do for yourself. You can probably do this with a glass of water or a cup of water and just simply, I've got a beaker here, and I just simply stick your finger in it, hold it there for a while, get your finger wet, and then blow across your finger. There will be a cooling sensation and what that is, that's an example of evaporative cooling, okay? Now, on a larger sense, I want you to think about this. I know some of you go swimming during the summer and you'll get in that pool and ah, that water feels so good while you're in there, hot day. And, well, you hate to come out, but when it's time to come out, you'll come out and get to the edge of the pool. And as you get out of the water and you're soaking wet, then all of a sudden you start cooling down. Sometimes you can cool down to where you just have to wrap up in a towel and your little teeth will start chattering because you're cold. And that's another example of evaporative cooling, okay? Now, I can remember growing up kind of in the country, and they had these big units that they put in the window of the house. And these units, they weren't air-conditioned units. They were what they call water coolers, okay? And these water coolers, they were very similar to a very large air-conditioned unit, but in the back of the water cooler, they had filters, or there was some type of padding. And I can remember my great-grandmother taking a water hose every so often, and she would go out behind that cooler, and she would wet those pads down or wet those filters down. And you know what? As soon as she did that, the air coming out of the vents of that water cooler, oh, man, it was cool. And we really enjoyed that, especially on a hot summer day okay now since that time guess what they've uh, come up with some new deals and we're going to 
test a couple of those new deals out in just a minute. But let me share this with you. When you sweat or perspire, that is your body releasing water, and you may have beads of water on your skin. So when that water is on your skin, as it begins to dry, guess what it's doing for your skin? It's cooling your skin. You see, water can hold heat without changing the water's temperature. It can also store heat. But when that water evaporates and changes into the gas form, guess what happens? It takes the heat with it as the gas form of water leaves your body. And I hope you understand that because that is very important. It's a way that our body temperatures are kind of kept under control by perspiring and sweating and depositing water on our skin and the water goes through that process of evaporation changing into the gas, the gas form is taking the heat away that was stored in the water. Now, the units that I want to show you, oh, they've been advertised all over the place, saying that your personal space can be kept cool. And we're going to put them through the test today. I have two of them. And uh, they look something like this. they got a vent in the front, in the back, guess what? They've got pads and filters, and in the top of them, they have a reservoir where you can put water. The water travels down to the pads, soaks the pads. There's a fan in the back. The fan sucks the air through the, the filter of the pads, and supposedly that air is cool enough to make you cool. Now, the first one I'm going to start, I'm going to go ahead and start the fan. Yep, I hear it. I'm going to give it a little chance to run a little bit. You guys know what a thermometer is? That's a scientific tool that we use to see how hot or cold something is, how hot or cold the air is, okay? And I'm going to use a thermometer to see what the temperature of the air coming out of this air cooler is, is at, okay? This is the thermometer that I'm going to use. You guys probably can't see the red line that's on the inside. But right now it's showing, oh, about 75 degrees. I'm going to put it in front of that airflow. Give it just a minute. Now I'm going to look at it. is right at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty good. Now, I'm also going to make sure about it because we're going to use a different type of thermometer. This is called a digital thermometer. And I'm going to take a reading in Celsius, okay? Put that probe right there in front of it. It's 23 degrees Celsius. Okay, now I'm going to turn this one off. Now I'm going to fix this other one up so that we can take a reading off of it. But before I do, remember the setup. Filter and pads in the back, a fan in there. That's the vent. We're going to pour a little water in the reservoir from this flask. Okay, and I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to let it run for a little bit. I can already feel that air. Wow, kind of cool. You'll see. Putting a ther thermometer in front of it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's probably going to be a difference in the thermometer reading because I can feel how cool the air is. Okay. Wow. It was right at 69 degrees Fahrenheit, guys. Okay, 69 degrees Fahrenheit. So there was a difference. Now, I noticed that the fan strength is not very strong. So, indeed, these little units probably wouldn't cool a whole room. You'd probably have to set one right in front of you 
to feel the effects. Now, keeping our body temperature down is very important. And we have a way to do that. When we perspire or sweat, that is part of our system called evaporative cooling, okay? But there are other living things in our world today, guess what? They don't cool like we do with perspiration or sweat. Take, for example, out at our barn. If you were here today, we could go visit the barn, and some of you have been here before in the past, and we got some very large hogs out there, pigs. And uh, a lot of times when I take students out there, they'll see these big old hogs and pigs. They'll say, ooh, ooh, they're nasty, they're nasty. Simply because they see them wallowing in the mud and in the water. You know what? They're doing that so that they can be cool. Because they do not sweat. They do not perspire. They do not have sweat glands. So that's the only way that they can kind of keep their body temperature down is to find water or mud to roll around in. And then when the water evaporates, they go through evaporative cooling, okay? Lowering their body temperature. And just think, if we didn't do it, oh man, we would be in trouble. We would be overheating most of the time, especially during the summer, and especially where we live in North Texas. And if those little pigs and hogs didn't have that mud or wallow, water to wall in, guess what? They would be in trouble. Students, listen. I hope I have given you an understanding about how evaporative cooling works and why it's important to life on our planet, especially for us and for some of the animals that live around us. And I'm going to give it back to Mr. Broughton so that if any of you have any questions, you can ask him and he'll hopefully have the answer for you. I want to thank you for your time, guys, and I want you to have a good day the rest of the day. All right, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Um, the question that came in was, um, what animals cool themselves using evaporative cooling? And um, one example that is an unusual example, I think, because we don't have these animals um, in the wild here in the United States, uh, are kangaroos. Um, there are kangaroos that live in Australia. In a very hot part of Australia, it's, it's uh, basically a desert. And to help themselves stay cool, they lick their arms like this over and over again and get their arm all wet with saliva or spit. And when that when that evaporates off their arms, it helps cool them down. So uh, even kangaroos in Australia use evaporative cooling to cool themselves. We just sweat, um, which is a lot better than having to lick ourselves, I think. Uh, now we're going to move on to exploring the sun and shade with Miss Nash. Oh, there we go. Well, hello, welcome students to my classroom, and we're thinking about sun and shade today. Which do you like best? Hmm, I think it depends on the time of year, don't you? In the summertime, we're looking for that shade all the time. But right now, today, or in the winter, that sun feels kind of good. Now, Mr. and I talked about sweating. There are other ways for us to stay cool in the summer, here in Texas, that's important. One thing we can do is wear, wear a hat. Wear a hat to keep your head cool, or choose which shirt you want to wear, a black one or a white one. I've had this in that sunlight. When I touch them, ooh, that one feels hot. And this one, not quite so hot. So to wear in summertime, smart to wear light colored clothing and wear a hat to keep your head head cooled off okay okay remember that the sun can be kind of dangerous here in texas now we can move around so we can for hot we can go find some shade relax a little bit but plants they're stuck where they are and i can't walk around so they have to make sure they're growing in the right place to start with so some plants, like a cactus like this one, like that one, they like the sun. They don't like to grow in the shade, so they need sun. Other kind of plants, like this one, it's a little fern, 
you won't see this out in the sun. It needs to be in the deep shade, okay, to survive. So plants have a preference, either sun or shade, or a little bit of both. Now, mostly the flowers we see are mostly out there in the sun. Not all of them, but mostly in the sun. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if that's because bees and butterflies like the sun too. So if you have a chance to go out to a flower garden, you might see that butterfly opening and closing its wings in the sun. It's getting warm enough to, to, to start flying around. Okay? They need that, that heat from the sun to go flying around. Now, other animals also may need to move around to regulate their body temperature. So a reptile, like my friend the turtle here, you might see these guys, they're called the slider, a red-eared slider. And they've got that red mark on the ear and then they slide into the pond when they get too close. But they're, you often see them basking. Okay, so basking means you're going to lie out there in the sun to warm up. These animals are not like us. So if you feel your neck, you're going to be warm. And that's your temperature almost all the time. Unless you get sick and get too hot. Or out in the sun too long and get too hot. But these animals, their body temperature changes depending on where they are. Okay, what time of year it is and where they are. So to get warm, this little turtle has to find a sunny spot to warm up. And if they get too hot, then they can slide back down into that cool water. So reptiles, like the turtle, like this little snake, you might see them sunning themselves in the, in the fall and the spring. Okay, when It can be a little bit cool. They'll be out, out there sitting in the sun to warm up. This little guy is called a gecko. And this little guy comes from a desert where it's really, really hot. So, so he's going to spend most of his time during the day in the shade, finding a nice, cool rock under a nice, cool, shady rock so he doesn't get too hot. So they can get too hot or they can get too cold. And they have to be able to move around to find the right temperature. Other animals, like this froggy here. This froggy is an amphibian. That means that mama frog laid her eggs in the water and the tadpoles lived in the water. But the adult frog can hop out of the water. But because they're amphibians, their skin is really delicate and special. And they dry out. So you won't see a froggy sitting in a, on a rock in the sun. If they need to stay in the shade, okay, or else they dry out, the sun can be bad. I've got another one here for shade. I'm covering up the secret. You get so nervous when you can't hide. I'm not really kidding. Oh, there. So here's another animal you might find in a nice shady spot. Now, we don't have these great giant ones here. You see the millipede? You see? Here's the little antenna. Okay, he doesn't like the sun very much either. He likes those nice, moist, shady spots under a tree. Okay. You'll find them under a rock or under a log where it's nice and shady and cool. And they eat dead leaves. Okay. They eat dead leaves. Okay. So now my challenge to you, what I'd like you to do is take a piece of paper and fold it in half. And then when you open it up, you can have two sides to your paper. And you can go outside and do some observations. And you can look at places that are sunny and places that are shady. Sun and shade. And see what kind, if the plants are the same. You can draw me a picture of a plant you saw in the sun, a plant you saw in the shade. Maybe you can find an animal. Maybe a butterfly or a bee out there in the sun. Or a bird. 
And then in the shade, maybe you'd find a little worm of some kind or a bug of some, an insect of some kind or different kinds of plants. So you can draw me some pictures of who's living in the sun and who's in the shade. Okay. So that's all I have for you. And if you have any questions, I'm sure Mr. Broughton will be glad to answer. Uh, yes, thank you, Miss Nash. Um, I just wanted to come out here to the barn to uh, show you those pigs that we have. So let me flip my camera on, and there we go. Um, this is Shotzi, and right behind her is Gracie. They are Berkshire hogs, uh, which originate from Europe. As I kind of show her whole body here, you will see that she's got mud stuck to the side of her. And why they do that is not because they're nasty. They, uh, they like to go into the mud and get that mud on them so that when the water evaporates off the mud, it helps cool their body because pigs cannot sweat. And you can see Gracie's got a lot of mud on her. And it's kind of laying in a little bit of mud um, herself here. And that mud also acts like a sunscreen for them too so they don't get sunburned. So let me get a little closer to her. These pigs, by the way, weigh about 600 pounds each. Um, so they are pretty large pigs. If they bump into you, that's like two offensive linemen from the Dallas Cowboys hitting you. So they, there's some big girls. But um, I'll show you one more. I think if I walk through the stall here. Yeah, she's right over here. Uh, this is a miniature pot-bellied pig. So she is smaller than Shotzi and Gracie. Here she's walking away, but she'll turn around here. And this is uh, Winnie. And she weighs about 200 pounds. And you can see that she does not have any mud on her today because uh, she has been inside the barn all day in the shade to stay cool. So she didn't need that mud. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, solar ovens with Mrs. Fuller. Hello, boys and girls. We're going to be talking about solar ovens today. I'm going to show you a solar oven right now. This is a solar oven. This is a store-bought kind. This is a kind we have here at the Environmental Center for you to make s'mores to demonstrate to you how, um, how solar ovens work. And essentially what, how they work is from direct rays of the sun and reflected rays of the sun. So the direct rays of the sun go straight down to the bottom. The bottom is all black. The black color absorbs the heat of the sun and helps heat up the oven. The reflected rays of the sun come from these sides over here that they look like aluminum foil and it reflects the the light deep inside the oven itself. I'm going to take the bottom off. Now, underneath these uh, wings, it's got all, it almost looks like a satellite, doesn't it? There is a plastic film here. Can you hear that? And there's a little hole in the middle to let any steam out. This keeps the heat from escaping the solar oven you put your food here in the bottom and this you see it's got a handle on the bottom you put it up in there and put it in the sun now if you've ever gone i'm gonna move over here if you've ever gone camping or gone to the park and Wanted to make s'mores, you can make those in these solar ovens. You don't have to have a campfire. And the solar ovens do not use electricity, and they do not use batteries. They use the heat from the sun. So it's very nifty and cost-effective. I'm going to show you one. Well, let me show you this one right here. You take a graham cracker, you put a piece of chocolate on it, and put it in the oven. You take another graham cracker, put it in the oven, 
and put marshmallows on top of it. Then you put the lid on it and set it in the sun. And it'll make your s'mores for you. So I've got some going in this one. And I'm going to take them out, show it to you. So here's our melted uh, marshmallows. And here's our melted chocolate. Can you see how nice and runny that chocolate is? You put them on top of each other. Squeeze it out. Can you see that nice chocolate oozing out the side? Doesn't that look delicious? And uh, didn't didn't have a didn't have to have a fire. Didn't have to have electricity. The heat from the sun cooked this more for us. So I'm gonna put him back. And you might say, well. You can't, you can't eat dessert for every meal. You have to have some food, right? Okay, well, here's another way. Here's a little cornware casserole with a lid. Here's a can of soup. You can open the can of soup and pour the contents into your casserole. Make sure you put the lid on it so to keep the heat and put it in the sun in your in your solar cooker just like this and it will it will heat your soup up for your lunch. Now, you can cook you can cook regular food in these. Now, it won't brown it. You can't grill or fry or anything like that. But you can, like if it's something that you would make in a slow cooker, you put it in your casserole or in a dark pot. That's really the best way. If you're going to cook something like, um, like a stew or something like that, or a casserole, put it in a dark pot with a lid and put it inside the solar oven. And that the darkness absorbs the heat. So you've got the heat of the oven plus with the, the dark pot, that's going to get it hot too. It can get real hot and it'll cook the food. Just like a slow cooker will. Except you don't need any electricity. Now, uh, you say, well, I, I don't have one of those. Guess what? You can make one. You can make one using a pizza box. And they're very simple to make. All you need is a pizza box, empty of course, no pizza in it, and a big piece of uh, black construction paper, and then newspaper to scrunch up and line it for the insulation. And then uh, your parent will have to cut a hole in the top to, so that you can tape uh, some plastic over that hole so it'll hold the um, the heat inside and you can make your own uh, your own solar oven with just the pizza box it's very simple and uh, it's a fun thing to do too if you go camping you can cook your food while you're on your hike and come back from your hike and your food is all done for you so i'm going to turn this back over to mr broughton if you have any questions about solar ovens He'd be glad to answer your questions for you. Thanks so much. Have a delightful afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. And the uh, question that came in was, where can I find uh, directions on how to make my own solar oven? And uh, the internet is a great place to find directions on how to do that. So the first thing you're going to need to do is find an adult to help you because you don't want to go on the internet um, without an adult. But I'm going to share my screen with you here and, and show you just how you do that. So there you can see my screen now. And um, if I go to google.com to start my search, I'm just going to write pizza box solar oven. And there are three videos that you could watch about how to do a pizza box solar oven. Or there's websites that you can read about too. I'm going to choose this one. Um, it's from Scientific American, which is a good website. And the title is Sunny Science Build a Pizza Box Solar Oven. 
and uh, it's going to tell you the key concepts that you have, that you're going to learn about um, as you build a solar oven. Uh, there's an introduction and background. It'll tell you all the materials that you need, um, and you can even see this. Have a, an, an adult help you when you do this, but uh, it'll tell you everything you need to do to you need to get to build your solar oven, and then the preparation and procedure tells you how to actually build it. So you can find that on the internet with an adult's help. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Mr. Ramirez, who's going to lead us through that bouncy ball investigation. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about how temperature can change materials. So we learned earlier with Mr. Monroe that temperature is just a measure of heat energy, and it generally tells us how hot or how cold something is. And hopefully you guys remember what science tool we use to measure temperature. And hopefully y'all said that that was a thermometer. Um, so a thermometer is just a science tool that can tell us temperature in terms of degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. And it's super easy to read. Um, generally, there's a red liquid inside the thermometer. If the liquid is all the way up here in these higher numbers, that usually means it's super hot. And if the liquid is towards the bottom, that means it's cold. Uh, so a thermometer is a good way to measure temperature. So temperature can tell us uh, the amount of heat energy. So we can make things hotter by adding heat energy, and we can make things cooler by taking away heat energy. So what are some ways that you have seen around the house that you or your uh, parents or adults have changed the amount of heat energy in an object? So let's look at some examples. We can add heat or make things hotter by using things like an oven, a microwave, a campfire, or you saw with Ms., uh, Mrs. Fuller, uh, we can use the sunlight and its heat energy to heat things up. Now, what are some ways that we can take away or remove heat to make things cooler? We have several things we can use. We have a fridge or a freezer. Uh, you can also add ice to your drinks to make them cooler, or um, if it's a cold day during the winter time, uh, the air temperature changes. It gets cooler during the winter time as well. Uh, so be thinking about what are ways that you at home change the temperature of things to make them uh, hotter or cooler, and why do you make them hotter or cooler? How does that benefit us? So we're going to take a look at an example using popsicles, probably everyone's favorite summer treat. So look at these two popsicles. Make some observations. What are some things that you see or notice? How do you think they feel? What do they look like? Um, now, since I'm able to hold them, I know that this one um, is hard and rigid, and this one is kind of squishy and soft, and you'll notice the, it moves, so it's a liquid. So what do you think happened to these different popsicles? Why are they so different? So when I bought them from the store, they were a liquid, and this is what a liquid looks like. It kind of, it moves. So when I bought it from the store, it was a liquid. But before we can enjoy it and eat it, we have to make it a solid. So we have a solid popsicle. So you have to make it uh, cooler. You have to take away heat energy. And what is the most common way to turn um, a liquid popsicle into a nice frozen one? Simply put it in the freezer. So when you put it in the freezer, we remove heat energy. And the liquid turns to a hard solid, our solid popsicle. And we see a change in phases. So we went from a liquid to a solid. Now in our bouncy ball experiment, we're going to see if all materials change, uh, change phases when they get heated or cooled. So we're going to be using um, bounce balls. And we're going to see how temperature affects the bouncy balls and their ability to um, bounce. So we're gonna see which ball will bounce the highest. So if we look at our little infographic here, we're gonna test a room temperature ball. So it's simply just a bounce ball that I've just left in my room at regular room temperature, which is about 72 degrees. Then we're gonna test um, what happens to a bounce ball when we put it in hot water. And then we're gonna test a bounce ball and see what happens uh, if we left it in the freezer. So make a prediction or a guess which what will happen to the bounce balls, but also which bounce ball do you think will bounce the highest and why? Now, I actually pre-recorded this during my lunch break because when I did it in the morning, my results were not what I had expected. And that is simply because 
Um, between the time that I take my frozen bounce ball out of the freezer and but by the time it's my turn to present, my frozen bounce ball had already warmed up so much um, that it was already room temperature. So if you repeat this experiment at home with an adult, you have to do it immediately after you take that bounce ball out of the freezer. Otherwise, uh, your results will not look the way they're supposed to. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and show you my quick little video um, of the experiment and then we'll talk about it um, in just a second. So let me um, present my screen and we'll watch that little video. We're going to be conducting an experimental investigation to see which ball will bounce the highest. So we're going to be using three different balls, a bouncy ball that's at room temperature, a bouncy ball that's uh, been heated, and a bouncy ball that's been uh, put inside a freezer. So let's look at our materials. We have a hot plate. The hot plate is heating our water and also the bounce ball, and it's about 90 degrees Celsius or 194 degrees Fahrenheit. We have our cold bouncy ball that was in the freezer and it's at about negative 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have our bouncy ball that's at room temperature and that's about 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So which ball do you think will bounce the highest? The ball that's been heated, the ball that's been cooled, or the room temperature ball? We're gonna document our results inside this chart. Now we only have time for one test um, but this is a good example of a data collection chart that we're going to be using. So we're going to be seeing which ball bounces the highest and we're going to record their heights. We're also going to be using this chart to help us mark down um, the height levels. So I have the heights written in inches and in centimeters and I simply used a meter stick to help me mark those heights. We're going to test the cold ball first, that way it doesn't have time to warm up in my room. We're going to drop it at a height of 43 inches. So hopefully you saw that it went just above 20 inches and I hope you heard that loud sound it made when it smacked the floor. So we're gonna put our mark for 20 inches for the cold ball. Now we did our cold ball and that was just above 20 inches for its height. So now we're gonna do the room temperature ball and we're gonna drop it at the same height, about 43 inches. So you can see it went around 35 inches. So we'll go ahead and mark that. And the last ball that we're going to test is the ball that's been heated using the hot plate. So I'm going to use a spoon to take that out of the um, hot plate in the hot water, and then we'll drop it again at the same height. And it went just above the room temperature ball. So you can see that the ball that bounced the lowest was the cold ball the room temperature ball and the hot ball actually bounce the highest. So we're going to discuss those results in just a little bit, um, but we're also going to take time to put our results into our little data chart as well. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then we'll talk about our results. Okay, so hopefully uh, these results were a lot better than what they were in the morning. Uh, because I was able to do it right after taking that uh, the cold frozen bounce ball out of the freezer. Uh, so these results are more of our accurate results. So hopefully you guys heard the sound this time. The ball that was in the freezer made a loud, very dense sound compared to the other two balls that were at room temperature or were heated. Um, and so if you were here, if you do that experiment at home, when you pick up that frozen, uh, the ball that was in the freezer, it really does feel different. It feels heavier and more solid. Um, so to explain what's happening in that experiment, all matter is made out of small particles. So if we look at our bounce balls here, uh, these little dots here are the particles that make up the bounce ball. So the particles that were in the cold ball, when I put it in the freezer, the particles that make up the ball uh, were moving very, very slowly. Um, so because they were moving so slow, they were not as elastic. Um, so elasticity, 
and that's this word here. I know it's a big word, but all it means is elasticity just means the ability of something to go back to its original shape. And y'all are already familiar with things that are elastic, something super common, a rubber band. So a rubber band is elastic because you can stretch it and it will go back to its original shape. A bounce ball is elastic and that's a property that makes the bounce ball a good ball to, to play with and bounce because it, it keeps that shape, it goes back. So when we freeze the bounce ball, the particles that make up the bounce ball are moving very slowly. So there's not a lot of energy in that ball when I drop it, it's not gonna go back up as high. The other two balls that were at room temperature and the one that was heated, the particles that make up the bounce ball are moving really fast. So there's a lot of energy inside the ball. So when I drop it, it can come back up a lot further. So all this is just referencing is elasticity. And you want a ball that has good elasticity because they are good bouncers. However, do you think a marble would be a good bounce ball? Y'all can test this at home. Um, it's not a good bounce ball because um, it, well, if I pick it up, I know that it feels more solid, but also it doesn't have good elasticity, so it's not going to bounce really well. Um, so the next thing I want to do uh, with y'all guys, I just have a quick reflection question. I'm going to show you guys a little video, and I want y'all to be thinking about how does the heating and freezing of water affect our farm animals out here? So let me just share my screen one last time. We're gonna look at a video of some of our um, ducks that live here. And they are gonna be playing in a little puddle of water looking for food. So be thinking about when it gets cold during the winter time, what's gonna to happen to that puddle of water? And when it's super hot during the summertime, will the water even be there anymore? We're just going to stop it there. Um, so those were our cute uh, ducks. Um, let me stop presenting. Again, just be thinking about what happens to that water when it's the winter time. What happens to that puddle of water when it's the hot summer time? How does it change? And how do those changes affect our farm animals? And that is all I have for you guys today on heating and cooling. Uh, we're going to give it back to Mr. Broughton, and he's going to answer any questions that y'all might have. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Uh, the question that came in was, would heating and cooling a rubber band affect its elasticity? And uh, I'm just going to say maybe. I don't know for sure. I've never tried that. But you could repeat um, that investigation um, just like Mr. Ramirez did using the bouncy balls, but instead use a rubber band to see what happens with that. All right, we're going to do a quick recap of what we did today. So let me just share my screen again. and. Uh, Today's field trip again was called heating and cooling, and during this virtual field trip, you observed changes in materials caused by heating and cooling. So Mr. Monroe um, explored evaporative cooling. Uh, Ms. Nash showed us what happens in the sun versus shade with plants and animals. Mrs. Fuller uh, used a solar oven to do some cooking, and Mr. Ramirez um, conducted that bouncy ball investigation. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this was our second ever uh, virtual field trip for first grade, so we'd like to know what you thought about it. And you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback um, to fill out a short form to give us feedback about this field trip. Um, we value your opinion and um, use that to improve what we do here. So I want to wish you a great afternoon, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.